Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jasmine, I'm from Carconet Press. Um, it's 7pm so I think we're going to start now. Uh, so I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, obviously we're here to launch John Glover's new collection that I have here, um, Birds on Mars. So thank you for being here, um, we really appreciate your support. So um, I'm looking forward to celebrating this book with you tonight. Um, tonight is going to run a little bit differently than normal. If you've been to our previous launches, um, this will be a bit different. So this evening we're going to be joined by John Whale and Rebecca Goss. Um, they're both Carcanet Northern House Poets. Um, that's an imprint that was set up by John Glover. Uh, now John Whale has worked for many years. Um, John Whale has worked with John Glover for many years on Stand Magazine um, from the University of Leeds. And um, Rebecca is also a teacher and a writer. Um, her most recent book, Girl, it came out last year um, with Carcanet Northern House that was shortlisted for the East Anglian Book Awards. So uh, both of John Whale and uh, Rebecca Goss's books are on our website. So if you don't know their work, please do check them out. Um, so we'll be hearing from them. They're going to have a bit of discussion between them. Um, and I have some videos that John Glover has kindly pre-recorded for us. Um, so I'm going to be streaming those videos and showing the text at the same time so you can read along. Um, now, John Glover is here, um, so it's going to be really weird for him because he will be attending his own poetry reading. Um, he's going to join us after um, we've watched the videos and he's going to have some time for audience questions um, with John Whale and Rebecca. So before I hand over to those guys, can you um, please just find um, on your computer or your phone the chat box? Um, obviously we can't see you. Um, I can see that some of you have found it already, but it would be cool if you could just Put some messages in there, say hello to us, let us know if you're enjoying the reading um, and what you think of what's going on. Um, the other thing I'd really like you to find is the Q&A box. Um, you might need to click more or something else like that on your screen. Um, but like I say, there will be time at the end of the event um, to talk to John Glover um, and you can put some questions to him about his work and about this new book. So please do find that box as well. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is that obviously you've all paid to be here, thank you, we really appreciate that. Um, you will get a code to buy the book, to get your £2 off the book. Um, I'll put it in the chat later on um, so that you can save it then, but it'll also come in an email tomorrow, so um, don't worry about that now. Um, so I think that's quite enough from me. I'm going to hand over now to Rebecca Goss and John Whale, um, and we will get this reading started. Hello, thank you Jasmine for that. And um, uh, hello everyone there this evening. Um, it feels slightly surreal, but it is um, really nice to be doing this event uh, for Carcanet with John Whale and for John Glover and with John Glover. I've known um, John a long time, both Johns actually, and I know them both through um, through Stand Magazine, uh, a journal I always admired and um, always hoped one day I would see my work inside its pages. And I um, submitted to them long before my first collection was published, well over a decade ago. And um, I have to say, John Glover ever since then has remained um, entirely loyal to my work, for which I've been very grateful. The nicest thing I think about um, when you do submit work to a journal and, it, and maybe you do find some journals that become a sort of home for your poems, um, that you also establish a bit of a relationship with the editor. And I think I've been um, really lucky in finding um, John Glover as, um, a, as, a, as not just a fine poet whose um, poems I admire, but also as an editor. Um, and the relationship we have, I, I don't know if it's unique, but I really like the way that uh, we have communicated over the years. John Glover uh, is an amazing editor, the way he pays attention to you and your work. But there's something so um, uh, human, I think, and gentle in his approach, because our, we've always um, communicated 
uh, there's always been a gentle correspondence, that's how I've always described it. Between us, there has been a long running gentle correspondence. So for a long time, we uh, exchanged poems um, uh, and he, I would send him new work and he would send work to me. And this wasn't even really with a look to getting it published anywhere. It was just part of the conversation we were having, getting to know each other, um, and getting to know each other's work. Um, and I'm going to steal something John Wales said actually when we were chatting last week. And he said that, that this idea of um, John, the way he communicates with people, he's brilliant on email, he does write letters. You know, I've had postcards and all sorts of missives from him over the years. And John Wales said that uh, he recognizes or sees, or me saying that to him triggered. Um, a belief that there is this buried epistolary content in in John's work and I think that's true John's poems are uh, he, uh, are about ways of communicating all his fascinating complex uh, ideas and the way he comprehends the world his poems are about how to communicate that and I do feel his poems are very much um, about wanting to make a connection with the reader about how he wants to talk um, to talk to us, to share things, to tell us things, because he is a poet of immense knowledge um, and uh, so widely read, so educated, so intelligent, but all the time manages to be so human in his poems, I think. Um, uh, but I'm extremely fond of John. He's, um, he's been a very good friend. I feel really uh, fortunate to know him as a man and a poet and an editor and a friend and uh, and it's lovely to be here tonight and I'm going to pass you on to John Whale now to say a bit more about John Glover, the person and the poet. Thanks, Rebecca. I've had the great privilege of knowing John Glover for 25 years, so almost a quarter of a century now and for 20 of those years I've worked with him on Stand magazine. And as Rebecca has said, um, that care and attention and generosity that John manifests as an editor, I think is very much a part of him as a poet. So I just want to say that just a little bit more of my long-standing working friendship with John in order to illustrate uh, and provide a way into the poems. Uh, because I think, I, you know, I. My own view is that John's poems are rightly and properly challenging. And I think John's characteristic generosity and geniality uh, can actually be um, beguiling when we have to deal with his poems, which are really quite steely, uh, at times quite imperative. And at times there's, there's a kind of irascible poetic intelligence going on. But first of all, I just want to establish a context for John, because I think that idea of, of the poetry business, um, working with poets, as we've heard, very considerately and engagedly, as he has done with Rebecca and myself, is a part of, of what his poems are. Um, he has worked for Stan since the mid-1960s, uh, as a student coming to Leeds to study English and philosophy, he set up, inaugurated, uh, not only uh, poetry magazines or arts magazines, but also an arts conference in the mid 1960s. Um, so John as an organizer, as a networker, as someone who is get always in the process of producing not only his own poems, but other people's poems, I think is really important for the work that he creates. Um, I think, I suppose an analog analog analogous situation would be that of Donald Hall, American poet who sadly died fairly recently, uh, who published a book, a, a book called Life Work. And it's that idea of, of poetry being part of a business, um, poetry which is communal and embedded uh, and contains uh, wonderful friendships and sacramental fidelities to friends. So what I would want to say is that within that, the poem has its own life. The poem has its own life in parallel with those fidelities and friendships 
And I think that was something that, you know, from my conversations with, with John Glover, uh, he picked up from the Gregory Fellow when he was a student, Peter Redgrove, and also, of course, uh, hugely from John Silkin. This idea that the poem has its own life. When John was very generously and helpfully um, editing my first volume, uh, we had a wonderful conversation in the standoffice, very typical John conversation, about the poems suddenly being perceived by me once they were published as a book, as, as being rather like children, that uh, all of a sudden, once they were born, uh, they entered into the world and had a real life of their own. And it was not for you to determine uh, their futures. You could help and support them, perhaps, but even more than children, you, you left them alone. You left the poems to find their way. So part of uh, what I'm saying, I suppose, is that embedded in this deep set of, of, of friendships uh, for which John is renowned is this business of the poem. There is a real objectivity to these poems at the heart of warm, generous, spirited friendships. And I think that's something that is difficult to hold on to sometimes. And as we'll find in the reading, something difficult to hold on to, especially when these are poems uh, dealing with very intimate subjects of, of love and death and mourning. So I think I'll end there, but I just want to provide a platform for the objectivity and the fierce determination with language that the poems have. As John has said in, in the blog very recently, uh, following uh, Anne Stevenson, uh, who had a whole series of lectures recently published, these poems are not about. So they deal with some of our most sensitive, our most important experiences, but they're not about them. They're their own way of exploring. They have their own poetic logic to them. They're not referential or certainly, indeed, not confessional. So I'm just, hopefully that provides a, a good starting point for thinking about the challenge that John's poems represent. Birdsong on Mars. Many years ago, I took part in a live launch of one of my earlier books, perhaps to the Niagara frontier. May have been in Waterstones. A celebrated poet, editor and critic was in the audience and he told me off afterwards for wittering on with background and explanation for so long before and after each poem that the poetry reading got lost. He was right, of course. One of the memorable readings by Geoffrey Hill that I have attended was a few years ago in Leeds. He read each of his chosen poems in composition order without background, dates, publication information or subject explanation or predicted impact. Each poem and the sequence as a whole did what it did. I'm tempted now to attempt the same, but immediately to break my hope or plea to myself, I might say that the first group that I'm going to read was written from 2011 to early 2019. They follow or emerge from three locations important in my life, upstate New York, the island of Mull and Bolton. Reading them again, I'm struck by the repetitions of the certainties or uncertainties of Brian Cox's new universe of space-time, by the ways in which subjects are what the words explore and give, that poems and their words imply, follow or promote action and drama. They are not about. Salamanders. Off to see the beaver dam last night, they might show up and splash their tails as warnings to the family. Aliens around. 
And they did, so I heard. I didn't go. Too far around the squashy pond and my shoes and legs wouldn't do so much. But there they were, plugging fast to the dam to make the trees more edible. Teeth to wear down. So much, so little of the world's scar tissue. Hold it in while you can and then pipework blocks. Try fluent redeeming stents imagined on an onward flow. Never mind though, I saw salamanders on the floor. No colour. The silence in this place when I'm not there, or the chair, the paper, the final ink. I'm in the forest as though in a first year tutor group for easy, dead end, repeat philosophy questions handed out or handed down. But Wittgenstein's remarks on colour in my lap leaves me slow, stuck as ever. White or whitish or pale grey or fine gloss sheets or leaves claim for anything held tight or divided forever between the shine and what's behind the transparency that won't go home. Colour slide. Elaine said, the white goes into the green, it makes it disappear. What did she and Nancy see? What was lost and what was left? There, on the computer screen, it slid brightly on as fairy lights or fireworks touching a finger end. Blameless landscape acquisition. Smile, though no one's hurt. Green, if no one's too innocent, too languid or too poor. August 2013 in Jefferson, New York. Yesterday, I picked up my first fall red leaves in years. Must have been a frost. Is that how it is? I was last in the US before 9-11. Some fall there. Today, the clothes take longer to dry outside. Beside being near Madrid's latitude, indeed, the sun is still high at midday, and civil wars are migrating, waiting on the roadside wires, deep in touch with sore sap as it wings down hard. It's a connection. Back at Elaine's childhood's house for another summer like before. So I put the chair down the end of the mown patch to stare by the forest through few still memories. Just the fraught dissimilarities joking. All the unallowed get stung if you go in got in the connection. Bird song on Mars. Watch clouds forever sussed out. Condensation for life or just this second. Extend rough pressure and airflow like organ bellows grind through hot lips and tragedies. The grey dripping curtains of rain, dust play fugues with talk certainty. Drop four kisses on the hills beneath, though that's a word of dross and rubbish. It's fallen into birdsong 
on Mars. The next poem was written in 1965 by my late wife, Elaine. It was published soon after our joint visit to an exhibition in Leeds uh, of drawings and poems by children and adults from the camp of Terezin. It is probable that Geoffrey Hill's poem, September Song, came from his visit to the same ex exhibition. The poems were written completely without knowledge of each other's work. I follow Elaine's poem with a more recent one by me, which partly grows from Alice Goodman's kind gift to me of Geoffrey Hill's walking stick. Looking at drawings from Teretzin, we usually stand touching before stars of David pinned to skeletons, before numbers sitting on boards, hung above and around with coats. Then, no numbers, coats piled to be taken. We stand, not touching. The gallery is still with walkers watching their shoes while they move as if towards a coffin, yet at funerals, relatives pat backs and whisper, the mums, the coffin, the body, so natural. And one or some can replace one dead, the functions at least, but the numbers on the walls are not a corpse in a polished coffin. Sticks. It's a crutch, it's a stick, it's for walking hopelessly. Handheld, squeezed tight, it's a pen. Stir with it. Stir black language on the floor. Wade, wade on like ink, the press down on paper. With so much thought or malice or love from my heart pressed down through my arm joints earthwards as though ink was drained through a blind hole catheter out down some place to make a mark stump stump stir given as though i knew where on earth this pressure was leading down write the incomprehensible black words leaning on my surface crap Asphalt, tar, papyrus, vellum, milk, and stir them into animal life, into human. Okay, uh, Rebecca and I are going to resume and uh, I'm going to go first this time and she's going to go second. Uh, any of you, and I can see the names uh, in the chat box, so I know a lot of people here tonight will know John very well, so we'll also have shared in something of the correspondence that Rebecca and I have been referring to. And if you have one of the most characteristic sign-offs within that correspondence from John, whether it's an email or a text, is the inimitable more anon. Um, and it seems to me that that is very characteristic of John and also has a bearing on the poems that what we're dealing always with, with, with here is unfinished process, that the poems are part of an, an unfinished process of grappling with the world, uh, grappling with ideas of identity and uh, perception through this really difficult medium that won't do quite what you want it to, language. So John's poems, I think, are full of revisitings and preoccupations as part 
of this process. And certainly one of the revisitings is evident in the latest collection. Uh, and that's the revisiting, as we've just heard, of upstate New York, from whence um, Elaine uh, came. And it's a very cherished, obviously, and a very celebrated uh, landscape, if we want to use that word, though I imagine John doesn't. Uh, territory might be a better word. Uh, so upstate New York is very much a, uh, a contested territory, uh, a colonial territory and a site of military fortification and warfare uh, involving both the indigenous peoples and the two colonial powers of, of Britain and France. And I can see why John has returned to this particular territory repeatedly in his poems, as he does in Birdsong on Mars. If we, I think it's helpful to go back to some of the earlier collections. So if we go back to a, a short pamphlet, uh, The Grasses Time, a Northern House pamphlet, that is dominantly um, dealing with perception in the field, as it were, of upstate rural New York near to Lake Ontario. Though it is, as ever with John, spliced with Bolton and the Pennines. Uh, that also forms the subject of our photographs and to the Niagara frontier. And I think there's a really interesting figure in our photographs, uh, which might at first glance appear to be a rather intimate and personal subject and uh, in great danger of sentiment, but not a bit of it with John Glover. Um, our photographs is an archeological curation of historical documents. So I think that's helpful preparing us for what we've got in the more recent collections, Glasses Elastic and Magnetic Resonance Imaging, where that idea of, of curating found objects and a historical politicized landscape has been replaced in terms of knowledges by uh, medical knowledges and by the laws of physics. Um, and the laws of physics inhabit the poems in a way that also, I think, uh, makes sure that an objectivity inheres within them, that they have a logic and sometimes a, 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 you know, a, 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 dis, a dispassionate logic of their own. Now, within some of these earlier collections, our photographs, for example, there is a key figure. Um, and we can see John in his notes, which is a very rare thing for him, given uh, what I was saying earlier, that one of the things he learned from Peter Redgrove was, was never to talk about his own poems. So having also been part of a, a poetry group for many years with John, one of the really frustrating things for anyone who doesn't, you know, who's um, unsuspecting and, and when he's finished reading it, asks him, John, what does this mean? Um, you just get a raised eyebrow and a stony silence for, for 10 minutes. So John, John, John holds in a very disciplined way to not being, as I was saying earlier, not being the interpreter of his own work. But there's a figure in our photographs, a historical figure, uh, a Scottish exile. And John puts that kind of exile, that word exile, uh, in uh, scare quotes, as it were. Uh, because this is a man sending letters back. Again, we've got this idea of a diaristic notation of the world, an epistolary ongoing correspondence with the world. And in the case of the exile, uh, the exile's letters back home to Scotland, where people are being uh, removed from the Scottish Highlands during the so-called clearances. They, these letters from this new colonial territory disturb those at home. And one of the things that John, I think, is, is very good at in these poems is disturbing that kind of surety of having a firm footing in the world. What he's more interested in is exploring the way in which language cracks open, language which he's actually quite um, suspicious of 
and frustrated by breaks open and creates its own world out of these encountered worlds of familiar geographies and geographies that of course are part of the heartfelt landscape of family and friendships but the way in which the poems deal with them is to deal with them in, in quite an objective spirit where the logic of the poem will take the poem where it wants to go. And it, as we know from the notes to, to this, uh, this volume, um, the, the poem will even dictate that the partners who are of couples who are very, very close friends can be disturbed by the logic of the poem. So the poem itself has the power to displace and disturb and rearrange the personal. And I think that's the real challenge of John's poetry. And I think we've got some fantastic examples of these returns as in the Salamander poem, which is just read out. But I suppose I'm also preparing for what Rebecca's going to say about the poems which I found very difficult to read on a personal level that are about uh, Elaine's death. I think they give us another, what I've tried to do is to give us just a, a, another way of thinking about the objectivity that is to be found in those heart-rending poems. And I'll pass over to Rebecca now. Um, thank you, John. Um, that was insightful and beautiful. Thank you. Um, Yes, I'm going to talk particularly about the mock sonnets, the section at the uh, end of Birdsong on Mars that is uh, dedicated to Elaine, for Elaine, poems about Elaine. Um, back in early May, I received one of uh, an email from John. We email each other fairly regularly anyway, and uh, tucked away within this email was this little quiet line that said, I've started writing again, may I show you sometime? And I just um, bit remember just being really struck by this line, being quite excited by this line in this email, because I knew that John had not picked up a pen since before Elaine's illness, and I knew he wasn't writing. So I knew what this statement meant, but I did not know, and I wasn't quite prepared for what was coming. So when he then sent me the poems, which he considered to be sort of in, in progress, as it were, these poems were you know, incredibly new, raw, you know, pieces of work and they came into my inbox and, um, but I can tell you they were emerging from him fully formed really. They were arriving as fully formed poems and they were coming quickly. Um, and as he says in the book, they were written in a quite a, a short, um, intense period of time. And I couldn't get the, I couldn't get my feedback to him quick enough before more poems arrived. Um, I feel really fortunate to have seen the work in progress, but to say again, I think I really see, saw the poems just as you were seeing them now, seeing and hearing them now. Um, I think it is interesting that they were written during lockdown. Um, John Glover may not see that as relevant particularly, but I think there was that very intense, difficult time and John, that, that time for him enabled him to, um, suddenly um, articulate everything that had happened and was happening and uh, this ongoing experience of um, losing, losing someone he loved so much. Um, but there's also something very interesting about the form that he has chosen what he, so he calls the mock sonnets, these 14 or 16 line poems with closer attention to the syllabic count. And he is a master of paying attention to that, the rhythm and the music of it. But, um, I think there's something to be said about the brevity and uh, why he chose the brevity. And I like what John says himself. And if you have the book or if you get the book, he says, he talking about the form, the sonnet form, he talks about uh, the limitations of it, that the limitations encouraged a swift, detailed look at some problem, be it neurological or emotional, and then permitted or revealed how to move on or stop usually hold. And I think that's exactly what the Elaine poems are doing, those mock sonnets, they are drawing us in to look uh, at, um, in, in a very detailed way at what was happening. 
but and also that idea of halting i think with the with the small poems as we read through the sequence they're so small that each one comes with its bit of white space at the end uh, at the end of the page and i think that that is john leaving us with some time to pause and absorb and remember elaine and i and I, when he says uses that word halt i think it's really interesting because i know so much has halted and everything is so different in john's life without elaine but i think also with that halting and that pausing comes a clarity, I think. And I think that's what John has been able to reach in some respects and for us all, some clarity about what happened. Um, I particularly like in the sequence a poem, my mum's 1920s hospital research where John refers to his um, mother's work in a path lab when she's looking at nerve tissue uh, through, a micros my, through a microscope, looking at it on lit slides. And uh, the line in it is that he's, um, she recalls seeing their nerve endings and he refers to their clear, bright stasis. And that I think is, um, I just, I love those three words, clear, bright stasis. And it's something I think he's achieved in the Elaine poems. He's, a, he's, he's stopped, he's, a, he's managed to stop this frantic experience of grief and stop it and write these poems um and there is a pause but there is a a bright clear understanding as well that has come with the through the act of writing um i'm, I'm not i'm not saying um there's come a, a resolution or anything like that that this is all sort of done and dealt with but an, an understanding of some sort and i'm particularly touched by what john said in in his own introduction to the sequence that he hopes that these poems he's written um will now enable a conversation to take place to continue to take place with him and Elaine and I was particularly touched by that and that resonated resonated with me particularly on lots of levels but I think that's what the poems are doing again and again it's going back to that idea of John how John communicates with with people and how important that is to him and I know I, I hear what you say, John Whale, about and what you said about John not being a confessional poet. And I agree with that. But I think we also touched on it a little bit when we had our own talk last week that these Elaine poems, they have, they, they've opened up a bit more. There is a bit more of John in these poems that maybe that we've seen before. I really did feel I was stepping inside his home and his garden and his life a little bit more than I had before and that he was introducing me to his friends and his family and and there was that opening up there and I think something I really really noticed on reading this sequence so many times is how much the word love is used in in the in in that sequence of mock sonnets so love there's the word love but also um you know the word is modified there's loved loveliness loves kindly touch um, and you will hear it in his first opening poem in the set coming he would minutes and more to be loved so the screen says that's from electric sheep but yes i counted in a sequence of 26 poems 18 poems contain the word love in some way and i think that even though the collection is about death and dying and the act of dying and he is asking us to look so closely at that i think the poems are really alive with his love for Elaine. So I hope you um, will enjoy listening to them now. The next group of poems were written very quickly this year, in some ways discovering or despairing through the space-time where my wife was going during the process of her dying from cancer. Many people helped through their love and visits and they appear in several of these poems. I'm grateful, as Elaine was, to Michael Schmidt who literally held her up, to her sister Nancy with her husband Jackson who visited from New York, to Jeff and Judith Wainwright, who introduced me to Elaine in 1965, and to our daughters, Abby and Rhiannon, 
who helped us with their children through these insoluble maths of space-time. In the later poems, couples' names are intentionally mixed up. It is also a strange irony in that, because of rebuilding at the hospital in Bolton, there was what was the maternity ward where our daughters were first loved is now A and E. Electric sleep, the technicals brought a hospital electronically inflating mattress for you to change the pressure on your body's pressure points. So to be no pressure there then. Minutes and more to be loved, so the screen says. And as you got out and in again, you had to be held up while the technics entered your needs. A human blood pressure cuddle round your arms so you couldn't walk or fall or be removed from here. We were hardly used to these lights and their digitized pace through frameworked new night. When you left it behind and chose a less predictable way to freedom. Countless. That poem's for Michael Schmidt. Cold blankets. Under the cold blanket scene, as dressed up for a higher examination. Though no questions worth long answers. Electricity preserves your pulled back certain smile. Loved, I wonder, for now. How to speak to your body from out the hospice fridge, though I need to stand right next to you for fear, for love, for ownership. Though to give you away just needs me to leave your humming bedside and this room. Signatures to collect. Their job, their duty, done. I want to go back in time, though, who do I ask? Words live repeatedly, come back, to, from, unheard, unseen, refrigerators, space. Infirmary, a place to greet or to say goodbye. Infirmaries love their places, mapped, held, placed. Got memorized forever as the location of the kind people and your births. On documents, proofs of identity, how we learned to love on, to thirst as love, and holding on forever, so it seemed, till counting out sleep time, suck time, alone, didn't work, and you had to help me to say goodbye, and to love, but what was left. Thank you. I held you first in the labour ward and the ambulance, mapping out the truth that you're here with all Elaine gave you, counting in your lips, fingers and eyesight. That poems for Abby in the labour ward and Annie in the ambulance. And now, gave birth. They helped to get the wheelchair to the ambulance. Stairs, edges, doors don't agree. For the drivers, it's normal to go. To slow stair lift and from stair lift tight skin talks. Lane, it was me who couldn't do actions. Clothes frighten. Steps frighten. Just words. You couldn't plead for your legs to be moved for the journey and out again down. Did I, who was just as stuck to help you 
or the driver in or out of disbelief. No way. No more doors to officially be counted just as helpless. More forms, more vocab the drivers used day and night to obey for unconsciousness, reporting through straps and adhesive gauges to help them to care and know. Annie joined us and Abby, just a few feet from where she gave you birth. Fittings. Jeff and Nancy, thanks for coming. None of us knew it was to say goodbye, though of course you said goodbye when you left each day, and Nancy back to New York. Bye. Poetry, pictures, old symmetries. Like you live in Jefferson or Didsbury. Places for the times and the time going. Would it be a comfort to love the gone? Subtracted from time space, from consciousness, outspoken, out told, out listened, out done by history and its names. Out silenced, stop it. Does our love in the doorway always cross out the sums? You were here, here to add, here to add planks, locks and fittings. Back to the beginning. To sit with us from marriages, so different but part of our lives, they flew in or drove round, Judith. And Jackson, from thousands or twenty miles. Visibilities, what counts? Adding up seen time, held as if or like, or instead of ceremony. No one asks if you've to be dead. But presence across the time boundaries lives clear and simple. Get on a plane or motorway or rehearse the state of our marriage tickets, please. Fuel refilled, safety checks done. It lets us all lift off for a moment till we all go on back. Go on. How? back to the beginning, if not, how, just now. Hello, are we um, way hoping for John to join us for the questions? Hello, John. Hello. Hello. I'm here. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you for your wonderful readings. We have some questions coming in. John and I will share them with you now. Um, shall I go first? Shall I read one and then you, John? I, I can't see the... Um... I just can't see the questions, to be honest. They're in the Q&A box. If you can find that. Um. Uh, there should be a button at the top or the bottom of your screen, John, um, that says Q&A. You might need to click more, dot, 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 more button. Yeah, okay, I've got, I've got them now, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're obscuring John Glover, but, you know, I'll, I'll have to live with it. <laughs> um, shall I read Michael's and then we'll go from yeah. there? Yeah. Uh, 
John, this question is from Michael Schmidt. He says, it was wonderful to hear you reading the new poems and the old and to hear Elaine's words too. I know that in recent months you have suddenly become fluent in ways you never were before, trusting your muse. What has happened? <laughs> what has happened? Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's very difficult to answer that question. Um, uh, I, I, I've only learned through listening to you and to, to John uh, today, really, what's happened. Um, so um, I will have to think um, long and hard as to why or how or in what, what way. I think that in practice, um, if you look at the book, you'll see uh, that for no plausible good reason in advance, um, I invented these mock sonnets um, and they provided a way into writing something and um, the decision to fill up uh, 14 lines in uh, a few minutes uh, was um, something which was either frightening or release or a revelation or scary. Uh, if, you, if you think there's something in them, thank you. Uh, I'm still only learning. Is that okay. <laughs> Shall we move on from that one? Uh, we've got a question here from Tony Rudolph, uh, which I notion, noted in the uh, chat as well. Uh, question for you, John. Uh, what is the difference between objective and extrospective? Um, I think John, judging by the chat, has in mind um, uh, a particular poet. Um, difference between objective and extrospective. Keith Douglas, I think he has in mind, and as well as Owen Lowery. That's, uh, again, uh, a, a, a difficult question. It's partly related to what you do and how you do it and when you do it. Uh, but the idea of not sitting down and philosophizing and not sitting down and uh, writing a commentary on life, the universe and everything, but basing something basing the words that you choose on what you can see um i think that was to some extent keith douglas's policy with extrospection how far extrospection works or is relevant in these most recent poems uh i'm not altogether sure though thank you tony and by implication thank you and lowry for uh, prompting me on that. I shall sleep on that tonight. Thank you. Our next question comes from Katie Glover-Jones and she asks, how are you finding using Zoom for your reading, John? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Um, will this be a long lecture? I'll try not. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a fascinating experience. I've watched uh, many of these Zoom events from Carcanet over the last few months and found them illuminating. And I um, hope that uh, some of what I've been doing and what my good friends, John Well and, and Rebecca Goss have been saying about me have been illuminating, certainly been illuminating for me. It, it, the sort of hour-long um, concentrated uh, d reading and discussion and commentary is, 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 I think, well worth carrying on with, even if we're allowed to meet in pubs and theatres again. Am I allowed to ask, ask a question? I can't, have we got any more down? Oh, we've got some yeah, more, I'm just scrolling down. Uh, 
Hannah Copley's got one. What a brilliant reading, John. I wonder when it came to composing your mock sonnets, which imperative came first, borrowing from a poem in the collection, listen or look? I'm sorry, John. I... I'll just read that again. What a brilliant reading, John. This is from Hannah Copley. I wonder when it came to composing your mock sonnets, which imperative came first, listen or look? Uh, thank you, Hannah, for the question. Uh, uh, neither of those came first. Um, I, I simply set down a series of numbers on 14 lines, some of them are 16 lines, um, and the words then happened. I did not have a prior intention, um, I believe it or not, and Michael Schmidt may be horrified when he hears this, uh, that in, since the 16th of um, uh, of, of September, uh, there's another 28 happened. And this it means that you don't set up a policy in advance, either technical or meaningful, apart from if I've written uh, uh, um, a series of, of syllable numbers over 14 lines, I fill those. Um, that's the imperative. Sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's not. But I don't set off. Um, uh, this afternoon's one, I did not set off with uh, a policy. The next question for you, John, is from Barbara Langley. She says, um, thanks to everyone, especially you, John. Much that we have heard and read makes me think of the work of W.S. Graham. Has he been an influence? Also, the new poetic voice after the period of silence caused by a great grief reminds me of Denise Riley's eventual revoicing with an even stronger, clearer impact. Uh, I don't know W.S. Graham well, and uh, I don't think, um, unless it's been uh, totally unconscious uh, that uh, it's been something that's appeared in these poems. Um, I, I, I respect Denise Riley enormously um, and I've heard her read. I don't think, again, that her techniques and interests have actually affected uh, what I've just written again, unless it was totally and utterly unconscious. So um, thank you for the question. Um, uh, I, th I find it a, a difficult one to answer. One here from somebody who goes by the name of Rhiannon Glover. <gasps> so I think this one could be difficult. Uh, how long does it take for you to write one poem? Lizzie. This afternoon, it was uh, half an hour, and um, the... Are you slowing up then? <laughs> yes, yes, some of them have been 20 minutes or less. Um, it, one of the advantages of, of knowing that you've only got 14 lines with 10 syllables in each line is that you know you've got to start and you know you've got to stop. Um, and uh, the coffee, coffee keeps me going. <laughs> but thank you for the question. I hope that the net result of, of them being so quick has not been that they are uh, boring, awkward, difficult, uh, or at least not more boring, more difficult, more... Uh, complicated than usual. How did you feel about them? I shouldn't ask you, should I? Well, from what I can see, John, it's all been incredibly well received. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> well, let me just uh, thank everyone for participating and uh, particularly for people who've just asked questions.
and we're, we're being given an instruction to wind things up. So uh, thank you very much, John, uh, for absolutely wonderful reading and for being so um, explicit and um, helpful in answer to questions. So that was, that was, that was uh, really meaningful and, uh, and really quite moving at times. I'll let Rebecca, um, Rebecca have the last word. Well, before, before Jasmine, possibly, but yes, thank you. It was, um, I, I was uh, really touched to be asked to be part of this evening and it was lovely to be here as John's um, friend and um, the, uh, sorry, I just saw another question pop in. Jasmine, are we allowed time for it? Not really, it's, uh, it's from Emma Trott. Yes, but please, um, please. Is, it, is it okay? Just one yes. last question. I just, hello, Emma. Um, John, have you got time for one last question from Emma Trott? Please, uh, if you've got the, uh, yes. Yes, it's here. Are the poems you're writing at the moment a continuation from the Elaine poems in Birdsong on Mars, that 28 that you spoke about, I think, or did publishing the book form a kind of break and set you in a new direction? Uh, strangely enough, uh, by uh, finding what happens to come out of the, the pen uh, on the blank piece of paper, um, they are both a continuation and something different. Um, one of the interesting, to me, aspects of, of what's going on is an exploration, again, of aspects of uh, upstate New York, particularly Lake Ontario, uh, and the strange place where Elaine grew up 20 miles from Niagara Falls. And this is coming up uh, time and again in these, in these poems. Whether they are a completely new uh, angle or slant or discovery, I have yet to find out. Thank you. Well, I look forward to them very much and I'm sure absolutely everyone here does too. So, um, um, just uh, to echo what John said, it was a particularly moving evening and I haven't seen you for ages in person and it was really lovely to see you tonight, but also to hear you. Because I've read the poem so many times, but to hear them was really quite something. So thank you and thank you to everyone out there for uh, listening and your questions. Thanks so much, John. I just want to thank you all um, also for being here and thank you, John and Rebecca for hosting this event. It was it was so nice to hear your conversation um, about John. And John, thank you for providing the recordings. Um, and thank you so much for answering the questions at the end. It's been a real treat to be here tonight. Um, and congratulations on your new book. I'm really looking forward to seeing the new poems. Um, and it's so great that there are more. Um, so for everyone who's here, thank you for paying to be here. Um, obviously, you will all get a discount code to buy the book. Please do buy the book. You need to read it all. Um, I've put that in the chat for you, so there's a link there, but check your email tomorrow. It'll come into your inbox. Um, if it doesn't arrive for any reason, please just get in touch with me and I can help. Um, I can send you to the website with the code and everything. So the last thing for me to say is please join us again uh, at the same time next week. We're launching a debut collection by an American poet, Sunita Chakraborty. Um, she'll be joined by Jane Ye. Um, so that's 7pm UK time next week. Um, Sumita is an amazing poet. She was shortlisted for a Forward Prize. Um, and there was a recent in, a review of the new book in the New York Times. So check it out um, and please do try and join us. Um, so I think that's everything that we need to say. Um, congratulations again, John. And thank you all for being here and for making this such a wonderful evening. I'll leave the chat open for a couple of minutes because um, I know you guys like to get your kind of last minute comments and stuff in there. Um, but that's everything for me and I'm going to go now. So thank you and good night.